1988 gab es einen großen, ersten großen Prozess, vielleicht war es ein Vorläufer auch der globalisierungskritischen Bewegung, es waren die Anti-IWF-Weltbank-Proteste in Berlin und eine Rednerin damals bei diesen Protesten war Vandana Shiva aus Indien, you might remember, Sie ist vielfach ausgezeichnete Wissenschaftlerin, Globalisierungskritikerin. Man kann sagen, eine der Gesichter der globalisierungskritischen Bewegung, Bürger- und Umweltrechtlerin und auch Autorin aus Indien. Sie erhielt 1993 den alternativen Nobelpreis, den Right Livelihood Award und ist für ihre Beiträge vor allem zu ökologisch-feministischen Themen in Diskursen der Entwicklungspolitiktheorie präsent in unseren Seminaren in Wien. Vandana, bist du sehr, sehr präsent mit deinen Texten. Sie ist Gründerin der Organisation Navdanya, die sich ganz stark für den Schutz biologischer und kultureller Vielfalt für Saatgut, den Erhalt von Saatgut und traditionellen Nutzpflanzen einführt. Und ich kündige schon das Thema an, weil dann der Applaus zur Begrüßung direkt in Ihre Rede untergeht. Vandana Shiva wird uns jetzt ein 30-minütiges Einleitungsstatement-Referat geben zu dem Übertitel Globalisierung Reloaded, die G20 und das globale Krisenmanagement. Begrüßen Sie, begrüßt ähm, bitte ganz herzlich mit mir Vandana Shiva. Thank you so much. And Ulrich reminding me of 1988. I feel very young. Uh, Emily, thank you for having us back in this amazing space that you open up to everyone, the true political use of a commons. And to dear friends, what happened? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have something to say to, to sure. everybody. Sure. Da sind noch sehr viele Leute draußen, die Vandana auch sprechen hören wollen. Okay. Könnt ihr bitte zusammenrücken, denn die werden jetzt hier reingelassen und um Unruhe zu vermeiden. Versucht also alle Plätze zu füllen, ganz ans Ende zu rücken, das sieht schon mal gut aus. Super. Okay. 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 Genau, und wenn wieder Ruhe eingekehrt ist, kann es weitergehen. Sorry. <lacht> All right? Yeah. Well, very, very warm greetings of solidarity to all of you. For me, it's very, very exciting that in today's very broken, very fragmented world, 70 organizations have come together to organize this alternative summit. And I love the logo. I absolutely love the logo. Because A, it tells us that the world is interconnected. You don't have to shape interconnection, which is the theme of the official G20. You shape something from the outside. You live solidarity from the inside. And also, in this interconnected, interrelated world, all of the emergence comes through a bit of chaos. I've never seen a straight line in nature. Never. There's always the adjustments that must take place in order to respect every other life that you are interrelated to. So compared to that need not, where the G20 thinks they're going to shape an interconnected world, this is what the world is really about. And I think today we have an opportunity to both recognize the weaknesses of the G20 and its false strengths, as well as our true strengths, and overcome and transcend our weaknesses. 
When I got off the flight and you come to collect your luggage, uh, there was a sign saying, welcome to the Sherpas. And as you know, you know the, the bureaucrats who slog it out for the leaders are called the Sherpas. But I see the G20 leaders as Sherpas themselves. Because G20 was born after the financial crisis to be a Sherpa for the global financial economy. When the 2008 Wall Street crisis hit, India was not touched. We were not touched because we were not linked to the global financial economy. 90% or more, probably 95% of India, lives outside that integrated system. And yet between the creation of G20 to today, we are literally being forced to be globalized financially. We weren't affected in 2008, but on the night of 8th of November, we were suddenly forced into a digital economy by making 90% of India's economy illegal. It's a complicated thing about a cash ban on, um, on a particular uh, set of notes, but it really was a ban on the livelihoods of independent, self-producing, self-creative people. Most of India and most of the world doesn't work either for government or corporations. Most of the world works in the sovereign people's economies as peasants, as small-scale producers, as service providers. I mean, I've done a calculation. Indian women run a water service of 10 billion. We haven't even started to actually calculate the true economy of nature and the true economy that people create, particularly women, because you, know, you created an idea of both work and growth that worked on the assumption that if you produce what you consume, you don't produce, which means nature doesn't produce because nature recycles everything. She evaporates the water and then it comes down. Within the ecological cycles of carbon, the carbon dioxide goes up, is absorbed by the trees, gives us life on Earth. Everything is a closed cycle. In any sustainable circular economy of nature or humanity, it has been reduced to zero by the growth indicators. And then with the, 19, with the 1995 globalization, you had a deregulation which allowed the financial economy to grow at the cost of real economies. And the crisis out of which G20 was born was part of that financial crisis, but G20 has been the Sherpa for allowing that concentration of the financial sector to keep growing. And there has been a lot of talk, oh, there's a new world order being created, the BRICS banks now, 100 billion, that's all they have, 100 billion. Four giant investment management firms. Each of them, five trillion, four trillion. Those are the people who are really controlling where the economy goes. Even the banks that created the Wall Street crisis have become small players. Goldman Sachs is less than a, bill, uh, a trillion. And I wanted to understand how, you know, this whole merger issue between Bayer and Monsanto. So we did a quick analysis. Who, who really owns these corporations? And it turns out that these giant asset firms, which are the money of that handful of billionaires who are now reduced to eight controlling half the wealth of the world, in the period when the G20 has existed, there were 388 billionaires who controlled as much wealth as the bottom half of humanity. This number dwindled to 177 in 2011, 150 in 2012, 92 in 2013, 80 in 2014, 62 in 2015, shriveling to a mere eight last year. 
their money is managed in these financial asset firms. And if you look at any corporation we deal with, you know, waking up to capitalism every day or being doing capitalism every day, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Walmart, Kraft, Yumi, um, General Mills, the Monsantos, the Syngentas, the DuPonts, the Dows, in all of them, the top 20% shares are in the hands of these small group, which is why they don't just push a globalization that hurts the planet and that hurts people, but they're invisible and unaccountable. And if you read the agenda of the G20 today, I see it one more group meeting of the Sherpas, saying, yes, sir, whatever order you give us to accumulate more at the cost of the planet and people, we are here to deliver. So look at the sentence, on the trade and economic growth. Growth and employment are dependent on free global trade. We've seen what 20 years has done. More than 300,000 Indian farmers have been pushed to suicide because of the trade treaties like the World Trade Organization and GATT. And the only new element in trade they introduced that weren't, wasn't part of international trade before was forcing intellectual property rights and seed, forcing globalization of agricultural trade, and forcing so-called sanitary and phytosanitary standards of food safety. There is an item in the agenda for the Hamburg meeting of G20 on women's economic empowerment, both of bringing digital economies to them, but only counting women's work when women are sucked into this collapsing system. Before I left India, I was having to deal with our food safety authority which is trying to go into the household of the tiniest woman making the most delicious pickles and poppers and all the brilliant diversity of traditional foods we make and burdening them with a police state. I, we, in India, we have a word for it called Inspector Raj. And the free economies of the people are now being policed and criminalized and the criminal economy of the 1% is being defined as the free trade and the free economy, and more freedom is being created for them. Look at the header on the spread of digital technology. First of all, it's made to look like it's a natural phenomena. And it's not. It's a very false phenomena. We know it because we saw what happened to India with the forcing of the digital economy on and India, where people don't even have a thatch on their roof, and they have expected each of them to have a computer, each of them to have a smartphone. Just on the 1st of July, four, five days ago, another forcing happened, now in the name of one tax. I mean, that's the other language that has come up out of shaping interconnectedness, which should be called forcing interconnectedness on the terms of the 1%. And it's always the language of one agriculture, one science, one market, one tax. So our government announced a whole new unified tax system, totally digitalized. It's going to be impossible in a country like India. But will they make exceptions? No, because the idea is to wipe out the small producer, the small trader, the small farmer. So India's tryst with GST, we use the language tryst with destiny when we became free of the British Empire. And interestingly, when our Declaration for Freedom was read at midnight by Jawaharlal Nehru, our current Prime Minister tried to do the same, held an announcement of a tax at midnight in Parliament. But that's not all. There are huge complaints of how costs are going up with this unified tax. So what do the government say? Won't use hammer, let market forces bring down the prices. Well, the hammer is the market. And when people say we should have affordable seed, we should have affordable medicine, 
we should not be taxing our indigenous production more. You know, the saris are being taxed more than the imported ready-made garments. The Indian Ayurvedic medicine is being taxed more than the pharmaceutical industry. So at every level, it is about punish the local, punish the sovereign, punish the people's economy in order to have this forced integ integration. Take the issue of health they're addressing. Of course, there are huge health problems in the world. They mention only one, Ebola. One doesn't say ignore Ebola, but I do say don't ignore the rest. I was trying to do a count. About 6,000 people had died in West Africa with the Ebola uh, <coughs> spread. But in India, there's 600,000 dying annually because of cancer. In the US, 595,000 dying of cancer. Right now, two things are happening related to one product that has been established to be carcinogen. Monsanto's Roundup, Monsanto's glyphosate. In Europe, you have a very, very big petition in, for the referendum, and it's crossed a million. And there's a thousand people who have sued Monsanto who became cancer victims for being told Roundup is safe, but it is actually cancer-causing. Shouldn't the G20 be looking at this and regulating the chemical criminals? I call them the poison cartel. I call them the poison cartel because they really are a group, which is a cartel, and its only skill is making poisons. It doesn't know anything else. It doesn't know how to really grow food. It doesn't know how to nourish the planet. It doesn't know how to care for the health of people. Monsanto is now merged with Bayer, Dow with DuPont, Syngenta with ChemChina. And the three, all of them have, not ChemChina, but the others, all have their roots in the war and Hitler's Germany. Their skill was to make chemicals that kill. Nerve gases for the concentration camps, poison gases for fighting the war. Every pesticide we use has been derived from those early attempts at finding chemicals to kill human beings. That is why when Bhopal happened in 1984 and killed 1,000, I turned to look at why are we using these ecocidal and genocidal chemicals and found out the history. And Bhopal, therefore, was not an accident. It wasn't that the chemicals were first found to kill a few insects and by accident killed some human beings. They were designed to kill human beings, then applied to agriculture after the wars, when these company, companies should have folded up and they did not. And then they mutated themselves into the biotech industry. I was a meeting in 87 where they laid out very clearly the agenda for their globalization. GMOs, patents on seed, and global treaties to pretend that seed was an invention of Monsanto and therefore intellectual property rights. So since that day, 1987, what I've done is defend the freedom of the seed, saving the seeds, and dealing with the kind of laws that Monsanto would put in place. We are very, very privileged in India that we managed to put in place laws that recognize that plants and animals are not inventions. And, you know, every time our prime minister goes to America, he's usually been handing over a little more of intellectual property. And every time I write an article and say, you know, you talk about Earth as family, Vasudeva Kutumkam. If it's Vasudeva Kutumkam, you can't allow Monsanto to bully, to say, we will change our laws to patent line. Monsanto suing India. I was in the courts the other day on this. I've intervened in the Supreme Court of Argentina because Argentina has an Article 6, like Article 3J that says plants and animals are not patentable. And we have an Article 3D, which is the basis of affordable medicine. Very, very important clause. These are the kind of monopolies that the corporations would like to create. And now they are coming up with not just new concentration, 
but new fabrications. So I worked on the Green Revolution in 1984 because Punjab, the land of the Green Revolution, erupted in violence. And that's where I first saw the connections between harm to the earth, harm to society, farmers' livelihoods, and the creation of conflict and instability in society. And I wrote a book then called The Violence of the Green Revolution for the United Nations University. It used to be said that we will now make bread from air. Why? Because the factories during the war that were used to burn fossil fuels at high temperature to fix nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, which then gave the explosives, could later be modified into making synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, the basis of industrial farming. And the argument was, now we make bread from air. And so we transcend every limit. What have chemical fertilizers given us? Dead soils. We've just finished a study on how wherever chemical fertilizers are being applied, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium is going down, but the zinc and the calcium and the iron, magnesium are disappearing. That's why your food is nutritionally empty and full of toxics. That nitrogen is running off into the oceans and creating dead zones, growing by the day. And it is emitting into the atmosphere as nitrous oxide, giving us a greenhouse gas 300 times more deadly than carbon dioxide. So we didn't create bread from air. We devastated this planet and destroyed in India the most prosperous group of farmers of Punjab. Then they came out with genetic engineering and said, we'll go food on the moon, in the Sahara, on toxic dumps. For 20 years, they gave us two applications herbicide tolerant and Bt resistant crops. One was supposed to control weeds, the other was supposed to control pests. The one that was supposed to control weeds has created super weeds so that half of America's farmlands have been devastated. And now they keep bringing the next lethal herbicide. Dicamba is spreading and farmers are having to sue because the drift is destroying their plants. And on the Bt cotton in India, it's a story of tragedy. Monsanto came in illegally. I had to sue them in the Supreme Court. Finally, they're very good at lubrication, managed to get the approvals. They jumped the price up 76,000%, the price of seed. Within no time, they had controlled every seed company of India, and 95% of the cotton seed is in their hands, which happens whenever they enter. And it's not working to control pests. Even this morning, I was getting news of the crop failures. That's why farmers started to get into debt and commit suicide. Today, of course, the seed companies are in more sectors, not through GMOs. We've managed to stop that so far with their chemicals. When you read the news from India about farmer suicides, it's all about debt to the poison cartel. Their latest, instead of saying the Green Revolution failed, genetic engineering failed. Their latest is this week's Newsweek. Chop and change. Yeah. Suddenly they have found, four years ago, in the life of a planet of billions of years of evolution, four years ago, they came up with a new tool called CRISPR. And Mr. Gates is a big pusher in this. And they really think it's like a text on a world program where you can chop cut and paste, but life is not cut and paste. Life is super integrated, super intelligent in ways we don't even know. So four years ago, they started this chop and paste, and um, some scientists started to work on it and found that for one edit, one gene edit, there are 500 to 1,000 changes in the genome that were not anticipated. In an integrated system, you should do good science and know that. But this integrated system is integrated through profits and to post-truth and to alternative facts. And so what are they doing? Something they've done, they did it with me, they did it with Seralini. They're attacking the scientists who are doing the basic research to see what happens when you do this cut and paste. And they're attacking the journals, they're attacking the scientists. So not only do we have a greed economy, 
This greed economy nourished by the G20 has to be an ignorance society. And the more there is ignorance, the more they talk about artificial intelligence. So quite clearly, G20 is not the power, it's just the Sherpa. And the powers are the corporations, but behind them, they're true owners, who are unaccountable to any country and any democracy of the world. To me, that is the strategic challenge we face today. So of course, Monsanto is, is jumping onto the digital bandwagon. It's now talking about digital agriculture. Farming without farmers. They've bought up the Climate Data Corporation, the Soil Data Corporation. They are controlling agricultural insurance and looking at a $3 trillion market in the next few years through the control through this thing they call big data. And I smile when I hear the word big data because the highest level at which humanity functions is wisdom, the ability to distinguish right and wrong, truth and falsehood. Then is knowledge. And in an interconnected world, knowledge is knowledge of those interconnections. That's ecology. That's solidarity. Then you have information. And then you have bits of information called data. Now, to add lots of ignorant data into big data doesn't add to more knowledge. Yeah. So the entire last year has been propaganda in big data. But the part of the big data, which is what you'll see in the declarations, the digital economy will be pushed. But the digital economy has two major consequences. Besides the fact it's pushing a failed model of how to deal with the living world. The first is on work, of course. There is more and more talk of a world without work. Zuckerberg just gave a talk in Harvard and said, today technology and automation are eliminating many jobs. Our generation will have to deal with tens of millions of jobs replaced by automation, like self-driving cars. And so at a time when the movements are working on car-less cities, you want driverless cars? Something you missed. And then they're talking about most jobs that exist today might disappear within decades as if artificial, intel as artificial intelligence outperforms humans in more tasks. It will replace humans in more and more jobs. And this person called Yuval Harari then says, and of course, most of humanity, being useless people, will create problem. So how do you keep them out of problems? You give them computer games to play. <laughs> and to ensure that they can buy the computer games, let's give them a universal basic income. So, of course, I have huge questions. What will it be? Will it be the $15 a day that movements in the US are demanding? That'll be 200 trillion. Will governments pay for it in a period of privatization where every strength of government in the public system is being incapacitated by precisely these robber barons? Um, the most significant aspect of the digital economy is what we have witnessed in the US election. And the US elections was really a digital election. Facebook's data was collected Companies that have come up to create these new algorithms used it by picking up, oh, so-and-so doesn't like women, and so-and-so doesn't like uh, blacks, and so-and-so doesn't like immigrants, and then feeding them 70,000 ads a day from Trump. So a business, a Newsweek said, maybe we have the first artificial intelligence president. <laughs> so you have this greed economy, irresponsible economy, for which the G20 are the Sherpas. And they constantly create new, new tools to think the world will be fooled. When colonization was taking place, the big civilizing mission was you had to be European and Christian. And of course, the rest of the world wasn't white. 
and it wasn't Christian, and that gave reason to take over their resources, take over their gold in India, take over the spices, take over the textiles. There is a civilizing mission in the G20 today. And that civilizing mission is to say, tools and money are the new religion, and we've got to force everyone into this fundamentalism. Our work is to recognize that if there's one dharma we have, it is to care for the earth and to care for each other and to never ever give up the qualities of care that build true economies, which is the art of living, which is the art of taking care of our home. Strategically, this means to challenge monarch cultures every time we face them and celebrate diversities, to resist the privatization of any commons, to resist the helping of the greed economy by the politics of hate, because it's the only currency through which a divide and rule policy can work today, and today's divide and rule will be a digital divide and rule, unlike in the times of the British. We have to give up the linear history of which the digitalization is the latest, and recognize that we have so many histories and so many ways of thinking and living in the world. The rights of all cultures, not just capitalist patriarchy, not just white supremacy, but the celebration of the qualities, particularly that indigenous people bring us today on how to live on this earth. The rights of Mother Earth, all species, going beyond anthropocentrism. Shaping an interconnected world is an anthropocentric phase. Recognizing the world is interconnected is the autopoetic phrase. Life and wellness and abundance is something we are creating, we can create in Navdanya. We have worked by saving seeds and biodiversity. We can feed two Indias. By working with the earth, we can feed two times the world planet, solving the climate crisis, solving the desertification crisis, solving the refugee crisis that's coming out of desertification and climate change. The Syria problem didn't just get erupt. In 2009, a million peasants were uprooted from the land because of, of drought, and the fact that the Green Revolution had wiped out the groundwater and the wells, that instability was then exploited by the global war machinery to create the multiple wars that Syria is living through, with half of Syria outside, part of Syria here. And unless we evolve our thinking to the true solidarity of being citizens of one planet, Earth citizens, and being a common humanity with all our diversity, uh, we will not be able to, to respond to the viciousness and criminality and brutality and the genocide and the ecocide that those who are driving the Sherpas of the G20 are willing to perpetrate on the world. Let us use the freedoms we've been given and the solidarities we can create to protect our beautiful world and shape it in the ways that each life form and each person deserves. Thank you.